a simple exercise that has been done in, in many different forms um, is flashing um, as I said, though, the right and left visual fields um, get projected onto the opposite hemisphere. And so you can flash um, something that just gets seen by, um, let's, I'm trying to think which would be, be more useful. Um, it just gets flashed to the right hemisphere. Um, so something in the left visual field is so shown left to, the eye, right to the right hemisphere. Right hemisphere. That's right. Um, and the, so the left hemisphere has not seen this object. Let's say it's a bell. Um, the left hemisphere has not seen this object. When you ask the person, did you see anything? Did we flash anything? She will say, no, I, I saw nothing. And then you ask the person to pick up their left hand and draw what they saw, and they will draw a bell. Or similarly, is... they'll put out cards. They'll put out, you know, a bell, a cat, a pencil, you know, many different cards and say, pick the card of the thing that you saw. And they I just want to, I just really want to like pause for a second, just in case anyone's yeah. like doing the, doing the washing up, not really paying attention. <laughs> yeah. Somebody has shown an image of a bell, is asked, what did you see? Say, so, I didn't say anything. I've got no idea. And yet when asked to draw what they saw, can draw it. It like... The, the implications for consciousness here, yeah. because that's what we're yeah. talking about. The idea the left, that the left hemisphere will be surprised when the person looks at it and you ask them, "Why did you draw a bell?" They will not know why. And or, crucially, here the, the left hemisphere yeah. is also sort of responsible for the for the speech stuff yes, going on. So, like right. the reporting that's actually coming out of one's mouth that's right. is is left hemisphere. And yeah. uh, for the me, right this hemisphere is, is mute. Yeah, this is this is this is terrifying because it, it sort of <laughs> implies that there is this conscious experience somewhere inside of me that, uh, like. There's some part of me that isn't aware of it, and the only part of me that can communicate is somehow disconnected from it. I mean, that is absolutely yeah. fascinating. But so, yeah. what happens I mean, I when think the chances that anything like that is happening in a brain that is connected is very low? So, I, you know, I should yeah. say that that's a very unique type of brain in which yeah, the, yeah. the hemisphere the, there's no communication, and even in some of these um, surgeries, they don't completely surgically split them because it's unnecessary, and you know. Um, so yeah, I, I don't to think be... I don't think this is the case for for healthy brains um, that are intact. But I think what is possible is there are other systems um, that are giving rise to conscious experiences. Um, sure, you know, very different from the ones that that we report on that we consider to be ours. You know, the brain is structured in such a way that it makes sense that we have memory that's, that certain things enter our memory stream, other things don't. Um, the reason we feel like a self, we can get into that a little bit if you're if you're interested. One one of the chapters of my documentary is about how the the feeling of being a self gets constructed. Um, but yes, just just to not terrify everyone <laughs> too much. <laughs> yeah. um, I think there's I, actually a way to see this that's actually quite beautiful um, and less scary. <laughs> Although I take your I take your point, um, and I've been creeped out by by many of these. Um, yeah, well, at the very least, well. it's exciting. Whether you're scared yeah. Or, yeah. or you yeah. can kind of romanticize it, it's very exciting. Yeah. I specifically well, and it's clear we don't we have not been thinking about things. Yeah, the right correct way. way. I mean, yeah. following intuitions that have very likely been misleading us about what consciousness is um, and where we yeah. might find it in the universe. In particular, so about the, the unity yeah. of the brain as the the product of a singular consciousness yes. that that sort of comes about as the result of atoms arranged in the right way inside of a say, inside yes. of cranium somewhere. Um, yes. But I, I did really want you to to just detail this example. It's it's a similar kind of study, but yeah, the interpreter yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so so they they do um, studies like this. Then in in some of them, they would ask the participant to perform some sort of action, um, and they would ask only the right hemisphere. So they wanted to make sure that the left hemisphere, the speaking reporting hemisphere, was not aware of the command. Um, I should also say the, these people have enrolled in this study. They're interested in understanding their own brains. You know, they're do they're not doing any of this against their will. They're happy to participate. They go willingly. Um, they understand all the implications and everything that's being studied. Um, and so they will um, communicate just to the right hemisphere of the brain something to the effect of I, I'm. I've read so many of these, I, I mix them up, but I'll give a, a general. Um, they'll say, you know, please stand up and go walk to the window at the other side of the room. Um, and so the right hemisphere understands this command and is happy to comply with the experimenters. We'll get up and, and start walking across the room. Then the experimenter will, will ask the subject, why did you walk to the other side of the room? 
now the only <laughs> the only conscious um you know being capable of answering out loud is the left hemisphere and this is something that's very strange that that Ian McGilchrist has done a lot of research on that I find fascinating um what happens in that case is the left hemisphere seems to almost instantaneously generate a reason that the person believes for why they got up and started walking. Um, and it doesn't seem to be that they're confabulating or that they're confused or, you know, this is done many, many, many times, repeated endlessly. Um, and so a person in this situation might say, oh, I, I was thirsty. I was going to get some water. Um, and, you know, time and time again, they they truly seem to believe this. They they somehow their brain generated a reason, you know, based on survival or whatever, however our brains have evolved, that um, there needs to, or cooperation between the two hemispheres, who knows, but, um, and so time and again, you give the person a command through the right hemisphere. We, you know, the experimenters know exactly why the person picked up that pencil, walked across the room, went to the elevator, whatever it was they were commanded to do. The left hemisphere has no idea and will say, oh, I needed to use the restroom. Oh, I thought I left my jacket in here. Um, and so Michael Gazaniga, the, the neuroscientist, the main neuroscientist who was involved in this research, um, calls this phenomenon the interpreter. Um, and there's a lot um, of interesting neuroscience suggesting that there is some type of process like this that takes place in a healthy brain. And, and the truth is we can we can see this taking place a lot. I mean, we're very um, story oriented um, animals. <laughs> we can make lots of connections very easily. And we often ha think we have reasons for our behavior um, that we, we know to be incorrect and yeah, so I mean, the the crucial observation in that I think is that yeah. when you walk someone through the split brain patient stuff, and you say, okay, you tell the right hands, the right hemisphere of the brain to get up and walk, yeah. and when you ask the person, and it's only the left hemisphere that can respond, you expect that they'll say, oh, I don't know why I did that. Oh, I've got exactly. no idea because because they're right. they're confused by it because they sure. don't have any conscious and they experience. have no reason to lie in that situation either. They they sh should be happy to. I mean, and others circumstances where they're being they're being interrogated about things they will say i don't know or i didn't see it you know yeah. these are people who are not yeah but in this case weirdly they don't say i don't know they 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 do know but they're yes, wrong but they're wrong and it just happens instantly and so yeah. you said that this can happen in or the sort of conjecture at least that this can mm -hmm. happen in healthy brains too how, how, what kind of sure. examples might that kind of thinking manifest and how would the interpreter work in a healthy brain so so there's one relevant study so so one place here that that we know um human beings are, are at least sometimes or are often wrong um, is in the process of decision making. And this is actually one of the intuitions that I like to um, shake up in, in all of my writing. And I, I do this in my documentary, this intuition that we have a conscious will. Um, and so I always like to distinguish between um, what I call free will and conscious will. Because free will, I think when most people use it, we're, we're talking about like a decision-making process that is in nature. Um, and clearly there are decision-making processes in nature and the more complex the organism, the more complex the decision-making process is. Um, what I'm terming conscious will is the sense that it is our consciousness. It is the conscious thought, the conscious experience, the conscious feeling that is the will itself. And what's interesting um, about what modern neuroscience tells us is that our conscious awareness of making the decision is at the tail end of a lot of other processing. Um, and so one more recent study that was done that, that I find so fascinating, um, I believe it was 2013 or 2014, um, they put participants in an FM fMRI machine and showed them a screen um, with two numbers. And they were given the instructions that with these two numbers, you can either add or subtract them. Um, there's a there's a kind of a clock with a second. I mean, it's not a clock with a second hand. I actually forget the name of the device, but it's um, so that the person and the participant in the scanner can mark the moment they make the decision. Um, so it's, you know, for all intents and purposes, a, a second hand going around. They look at two numbers. They know they're going to decide whether to add or subtract the two numbers. They mark the moment where they make the decision. Um, and all the while, their brains are being scanned um, functionally in an MRI machine, 
And the researchers can tell up to four seconds um, not only which um, they, they were going to decide whether to add or subtract, um, but at what, sorry, not just when, <laughs> but, but what, what they were going to do, whether they were going to add or subtract. Um, so up to four seconds prior, they know when the decision is going to be made and what decision will be made. Um, there are kind of countless examples of this. I talk a lot about priming, um, priming processes in the brain um, in, in my book and in, in my documentary series, which again shows lots of processes that feel to us um, that we are consciously in the present moment with them, when in fact, all of these things are taking place before we have any conscious awareness of them. So, so um, sorry, did I say priming? I, I didn't mean priming. David Eagleman talks about this a lot in his work, where um, all, all of the signals that are kind of coming in through our senses come in at different times. Um, binding. These are binding, uh, binding right. Yes. So, put, so putting together... Um, uh, different sort of sensory inputs, light, That's sound, right. yes. all that kind of stuff. And so and sound sort of waves travel at different speeds than light waves, um, our touch receptors, and then all of these things need to be communicated to the brain. They all take different amounts of time to be received by the brain and then processed by the brain. All of that happens in about 500 milliseconds before we have the experience of whatever it is, hit, you know, hitting a key on the piano or playing tennis. We have the experience of seeing the ball hit the racket, hearing the ball hit the racket, and feeling it hit the racket all in the same moment when the signals are actually traveling at different speeds and get processed by the brain at different speeds. Um, and so these are all called binding processes. Again, it shows how our conscious experience kind of lags behind the physical world, where all of these things are taking place that feel that, you know, we are we are receiving them in the exact moment that they're taking place, when in fact our conscious awareness is often, I would say most often, at the tail end of a lot of processing, including decision making. And so we have this experience. Um, I think it's another reason why we've assumed that consciousness is, is complex. We have this experience that making a decision happens in the conscious, in the present moment of the conscious experience, when in fact, almost everything is put into place before you have the experience. And this is related to the interpreter, where you can have an experience of saying, oh, yes, I'm, I'm thirsty, and that's why. Um, when you're kind of unaware of all the behind-the-scenes processing that's taking place before you have the conscious experience. 